I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. This episode, we are wrapping up our three-part series on George Bernard Shaw, otherwise known as GBS, and his phenomenally successful play, Pygmalion. In week one, we introduced Shaw, some of his political ideologies. Um, we introduced the Greek myth Pygmalion from where Shaw took his inspiration, as well as Act One. Last week, we discussed Acts Two and Three. We talked about uh, Rosenthal's revolutionary psychological discovery uh, that was titled The Pygmalion Effect. We spoke to the symbolism of language, of clothes, of the gramophone and mirrors. We highlighted the parallels between Alfred Doolittle and Professor Higgins. We allowed Shaw to preach at us as he humorously characterized the undeserving poor and the middle class morality, all Shawian terms. And finally, we got to Eliza, uh, the flower girl transformed into a duchess, crashing through that point of no return, otherwise known as the climax of the story. And she uh, fools all of good society into thinking she's genteel. Getting away with declaring that it was not bloody likely that she'd be walking home, but would be taking a taxi. Oh, that language. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> uh, of course, all of it is meant to be didactic, uh, a word that he uses when he's talking about his moralizing and, and his funny way. We smile when Alfred Doolittle justifies begging for money to buy liquor by claiming that it, it can't possibly ruin him. It'll all be gone by the end of the weekend. He further claims, and this is Shaw's moral judgment towards us theater attenders, that uh, the poor can't afford morals. Morals are luxuries of the middle class. Shaw's wit is on full display as he sermonizes us into the final two acts of the play. Of course, they sermonize the most, but also arguably they're the most entertaining for the very same reason. We referenced the end of the play and that Shaw would never have endorsed the thematic license that My Fair Lady took with their ending. But today we will explain case, Shaw's case why. For a good long time, I agreed with the criticism and, and I was irritated at Shaw's anticlimactic ending. But having said that, after reading his think sequel, thinking about his commentary and understanding better Shaw's purpose for having the ending end the way it does, I completely agree with Shaw. I'm sure he would be <laughs> <laughs> say, I told you so. Uh, there's no other way to end except for Higgins and Eliza to part ways. Well, uh, you know, there went that. And uh, <laughs> I hope it's okay that we're going to spoil the ending at this point. Oh, no. Uh, you know, let me put it this way. If you've watched My Fair Lady or Pygma Pygmalion, you might think that Shaw thinks that Shaw spoiled his own ending because there is not a happily ever after ending to this romantic comedy. And people feel deceived when they get to the end because romantic comedies are not supposed to end in angst. Uh, but especially one with the word romance in the title. I mean, we haven't uh, brought it out yet, but there's a subtitle of this play, and many have claimed Shaw was misleading us with what he's attempting to do, to do in a play through the subtitle. The full title of the play is Pygmalion, A Romance in Five Acts. <laughs> uh, he labels it a romantic comedy, and most people um, reading that reasonably assume certain characteristics that... Um, that are usual comedies, at least classically modeled ones. And for one, there should be a wedding at the end. And secondly, <laughs> the lead man should end up with a lead woman, a love story gone right. Everyone knows comedies end in marriage, tragedies end in death. Well, and, and Shaw would remind you that he f is following this unwritten law of the rom-com because he does have a wedding at the end just not Eliza's wedding. She and Higgins do not get together. In fact, Shaw insists to the point of irritation that it is in a violation of everything he's constructed in the play to encourage such a hypothesis. This could never happen. Higgins and Eliza can never get together. It destroys everything. <laughs> well, destroys everything. That I mean, that's pretty uh, huge language. Well, it's decisive, and and this was not well received by audiences for one, and it wasn't well received by directors or movie producers at all. In fact, Shaw was so concerned that people would violate his will at the end, he wanted no part in allowing his play to become a musical. In fact. 
and he said that he would sue for infringement of copyright anyone ever mentioning a musical adaptation to his play. Mm. In 1921, a man by the name of Franz Lahar tried, and that was completely shot down. Shaw's purposes could not be accomplished in a musical. It got to the point that Shaw went back and wrote a sequel to Pygmalion, making sure people understood this. His line of reasoning, which he clarifies in his single, hinges on the understanding that the play must end in anticlimax. And perhaps that is what is most annoying. What the heck? Who likes anticlimaxes? By definition, they're supposed to be annoying. Of course, when you look at Shaw's other work, you can see that, you know, being nice anticlimactic is something of a hallmark for him, not just Pygmalion. I'm worth thinking about from a philosophical perspective because he is so consistent about it. Why do it? Is Shaw trying to irritate us because he just enjoys irritating us? You know, that's probably part of it. <laughs> but Shaw embraces anticlimax almost instinctively. <laughs> I think he enjoys irritating people. <laughs> And, you know, let's define anticlimax. What do you mean when you say his stories have anticlimactic endings? Sure. The easy way would be to say they just don't end right. <laughs> I mean, he ends with a comic deflation of a grandiose tale. That's not what we want. We want a grandiose end to a comic tale. The grand climactic ending of the story would be a dramatic pledging of eternal love, a princess-style wedding, a happily ever after, you know, Think every rom-com you've ever seen. Uh, The Princess Diaries, for example. But Shaw rejects this. For one reason, he doesn't believe in it. And not only, and not just because that everything ends in death. He's not trying to be nihilistic. He doesn't believe in finality. He says that's just not how love works. Things don't end. Not really. It's not that they end with a bang or end with a whimper. They just never really end. End. There's not an end to anything. Life carries on. It's open ended. There's always more. So we must imagine he likes to recreate this open endedness. And when we understand that, we understand that when Shaw sits down to write his sequel, the first thing that he wants to do is scold us because we're requiring him to write a sequel. So let's read the first paragraph of that sequel and, and take our beating. The rest of the story need not be shown in action and indeed would hardly need telling if our imaginations were not so enfeebled by their lazy dependence on the ready-mades and reach-me-downs of the rag shop in which romance keeps its stock of happy endings to misfit all stories. Now the history of Eliza Doolittle, though called a romance because the transfiguration it records, seems exceedingly improbable, is common enough. Such transfigurations have been achieved by hundreds of resolutely ambitious young women since Nell Gwynn set them the example by playing queens and fascinating kings in a theater in which she began by selling oranges. Nevertheless, people in all directions have assumed, for no other reason than that, that she became the heroine of a romance, that she must have married the hero of it. This is unbearable, not only because of her little drama, if acted on, such a thoughtless assumption must be spoiled, but because the true sequel is patent to anyone with a sense of human nature in general and of feminine instinct in particular. Let's develop this concept of human nature in general and feminine instinct in particular. This idea is very interesting. What about human nature? What about feminine instinct? What is Shaw talking about? What's he illustrated in this play that absolutely foregoes any chance of the two lead characters getting together? So to answer that question, let's go to act four. It's midnight. Higgins and Pickering are talking in the Wimple Street Laboratory. Eliza walks in, exhausted, but still very beautiful from the party. And Higgins and Pickering are congratulating each other, telling how well they have done. Higgins is also looking for his slippers. Higgins proclaims that he can at last go to bed without dreading the next day since the party is finally over. He turns to talk to Eliza, but instead of congratulating or even acknowledging her, he commands her to do a series of menial tasks for him. She responds by snatching up his slippers, hurling them at him with all of her force. Let's read their exchange. What on earth? What's the matter? Get up. Anything wrong? 
Nothing wrong with you. I've won your bet for you, haven't I? That's enough for you. I don't matter, I suppose. You won my bet? You? Presumptuous insect. I won it. What did you throw those slippers at me for? Not even from her moment of triumph. He cannot refrain from insulting Eliza. But this time, instead of just taking it, she's going to respond. It reminds me of what my brother told me once when we were discussing a woman who was leaving her husband. My brother, who doesn't claim to be a philosopher, saw the reason for the divorce very plainly, and he reduced the entire divorce down to one idea. And he said, I'll quote him here, it turns out people don't like being treated poorly. <laughs> <laughs> That's philosophical genius. You know, well, I agree with Tim on that. Uh, people don't. And I see El Eliza seems to feel that she is treated poorly in this relationship. And him calling her an insect does seem to be evidence that this is an ongoing occurrence. Um, keep reading her lines, Christy, because she goes farther than just throwing slippers. She's going to use her words. Because I want to smash your face. I like to kill you, you selfish brute. Why didn't you leave me where you picked me up out of the gutter? You thank God it's all over, and, and now you can throw me back again there, do you? Hmm. You, you know, it sounds like she's found her agency, and uh, she's found her uh, moral center, really. I mean, Higgins is not living up to a proper um, moral relationship with her, and she's calling him out on it. Uh, he's exposed uh, for all of his haughty and dehumanizing arrogance paraded around, disguised as kindness and virtue, which is always a horrible thing. He's a bully and a brute, and, and that slipper is a symbol of all that upper-class pretension, and it's being thrown in his face. And she's <laughs> also arguing that he has a moral obligation to her as her creator. You know, what Higgins has done uh, cannot be undone, and she cannot go back to the gutter. And he wants to take credit for his creation, but he doesn't want to take moral responsibility for it. Uh, and this, from one way of looking at the world, is immoral. I mean, he doesn't see it that way, and they're at an impasse. And I would like to point out, is it too far of a stretch to say that this has echoes of Frankenstein going on here? <laughs> In some ways it does, yeah, for sure. And I think it's absolutely what that slipper throwing rage is trying to embody. And I, I think even if you don't even think about symbolism and things of those nature, every viewer feels it when she throws it. We all feel slighted when he takes credit for what she's done. And it makes our respect for Colonel Pickering go down as well because it doesn't defend her. There is another interesting idea of Shaw's that I think a philosophy of his that I want to throw into the mix, a little theory. And, and this is slightly philosophical, but I think it's it's interesting. Shaw believed in something that he called life force. Uh, and this not this isn't just in Pygmalion. And if you really want to see it back out, you know, watch Man and Superman. Uh, and he's not talking about, you know, the red cape guy. But Shaw believed that all organisms have a degree of consciousness, memory, and will. Even biologically, he believed that if we tried hard enough, over time, and, you know, evolutionary speaking, we would develop an eye, a nose, a digestive tract, even things like the ability to ride a bicycle. And he believed that over time, by sheer force, we evolve into, and we will evolve into something that he calls a Superman, an angel type of being, you know, something like that. But he believed that there is just this force inside of us, and it contrives to build up intelligence. And he also thinks that women particularly feel this more than men do, and it's not for any other reason, except we function in this world by physically producing heirs for the future. Now, I'm not trying to engage in any kind of political, gender political discussion here, uh, but these are his thoughts. Uh, there's no doubt Shaw is expressing a vision of this thing he calls life force through the character of Eliza, because Eliza fights. She fights as a flower girl. She fights her way to learn phonetics. She fights to become this duchess. And so now she must fight Higgins, her creator. She's outgrowing him because there's a life force inside of her and it cannot be stopped. Perhaps Higgins has his own life force, but we don't really see it. She's outpacing him as an evolutionary human being. She knows at this moment something perhaps that she'd been unwilling to accept. But now at this moment, she must accept it. 
because she knows Higgins and what he is and isn't capable of, that she will always be an insect to him. She'll be a squash cabbage. And there is something in him that won't let her grow. And this realization makes her scream. Up to this point, maybe she had held hopes that if she could just become a duchess, the scales would be balanced between them and he would change how he views her and his view of their relationship, that it was capable of, all, of evolving. But his mother said it better than anyone. Higgins is incorrigible. He will never bend and he certainly will not concede anything to Eliza. The relationship between these two will always be one of submission on her part and only submission. Understanding this makes that life force within her rebel. Higgins will not be a suitable husband, and therefore she must recoil from the very idea and find another suitable mate. For Shaw, that's evolutionary. This is non-controvertible and a disregard for everything inside a strong female. She cannot and will not allow herself to perpetuate an um, objectification, which is what he has. Man, that's a lot of theory right there. I know. <laughs> I kind of like You know, it. and I'm sure evolutionary psychologists use those same terms, but I think there are, uh, there's a lot of data today that would support Shaw's claim here. Uh, I want to point out the strength of character that Eliza exerts here and she does not leave without giving him an opportunity to redeem himself, an opportunity to explain himself. And, of course, he is going to fail. I mean, uh, as she kept asking him over and over, what is to become of me? Uh, viewers keep hoping he will rise to the occasion and say, we're partners here. Um, you will work for me or work with me. We will set up shop, I mean, if you like, and I'll teach you how to teach others. But he never does that. You know, instead, he makes a really base offer. He says something awful. And he says, you see, Eliza, all men are not confirmed old bachelors like me and the colonel. Most men are the marrying sort, poor devils. And you're not bad looking. It's quite a pleasure to look at you sometimes. Not now, of course, because you're crying and looking as ugly as the very devil. But when you're all right and quite yourself, you're what I should call attractive. That is to the people in the marrying line. So is, I mean, that, is that a compliment or not? I mean, he can't even tell her she's pretty. He just makes me angry. Well, he's not done. It's going to get worse. <laughs> I dare say my mother could find some chap or other who would do very well. I mean, that's the worst line of all. Find a chap who will just do. I know it, it is. And Eliza calls him out on it. I love how she responds. She says this. We were above that at the corner of Tottenham Court. I sold flowers. I didn't sell myself. Now you've made a lady of me and I'm not fit to sell anything else. I wish you'd left me where you found me. In other words, when I was a flower girl, at least I was a, an acknowledged person. I didn't realize you were developing a product that you were turning me into some sort of commodity. You know, which, of course, um, how he sees her and how he continues to see her till the very end. That's that's he never changes the view. And that is why she has no choice but to walk out the door and never come back. And uh, she's rejecting dehumanization, even if it is dressed up with jewels and taxis. Go girl. <laughs> <laughs> her life force. I know it's that life force and an extended version. When, and, and remember he has certain versions that he said can only be done if you had, you know, the tech technology to do it. But she walks out the door and she finds Freddie just waiting for her. Apparently that's where he spends all of his nights at her window. And when she asks him what he's doing there, he tells her it's the only place where he's happy. And she responds with an interesting question. And if you know about Shaw's life force theory that I just told you about, it makes more sense. She asks this, Freddie, you don't think I'm a heartless gutter snipe. In other words, what am I to you? How do you see me? And in the extended version of the play, there's another interesting addition because they spend the entire night together just wandering around town. She rides in a taxi with Freddie until daylight. And then she gets dropped off at Mrs. Higgins' house. I want to point out that Freddie has no money. <laughs> he tells her before they even get a cab that he doesn't have any money to even pay for it. Which I find this is an, an incredibly interesting detail. Why does Freddie have to be poor? I mean, for a play where money is in the background of every single interaction, to some degree, 
why make Freddie poor? Do you think that's why maybe he's goofy and unappealing in the play? I've told you many times, money makes even the ugliest men attractive. <laughs> uh, I believe I've seen that rule applied many times. And um, uh, and if you do any celebrity watching, uh, we see it play out over and over again. I mean, women and men, if we're speaking evolutionary psychology, you know, they will instinctually make the best deal they can make. And um, since money ensures survival, uh, money makes men more attractive, you know, except for Shaw. There's a caveat. Um, it's explained at length in the sequel, but I find it such an interesting, uh, you know, refinement of the traditional wisdom that money makes men more attractive. <laughs> Apparently, for Shaw, at least, and I think he's right about this, there can be exceptions to this. And he's about to explain what calls for an exception to, you know, seeming evolutionary law of the universe. And Eliza has a lot uh, to think about that, and she must think about her own survival. And it's a concern that has been a, a motif from the opening of the play and will be the closing argument of Act 5. Eliza has options. Uh, first, she has a man with money who wants her to stick around in order to keep track of his appointments and get his tea or coffee and entertain him. And of course, don't forget, fetch his slippers for the rest of his life. And uh, that is option one. But then there's Freddie here. And as Shaw puts it in the sequel, Freddie adores her. He worships her. He's ready to live his life for her. And the only caveat is that he has no money. So, you know, there's a dilemma. Uh, I do notice that love has nothing to do with either relationship. And that seems by Shaw's design. I mean, Shaw isn't writing about love and his romance in five acts. No, I mean, he, in some ways, he's writing about math. I mean, it's the calculus of this equation that's going to take the entire night. Does a woman want a man for money or for dignity? And remember, love isn't a factor. If you remember from the sequel, it annoys Shaw in the first place that people think she must have to have somebody. Shaw doesn't think she should have to make this choice. But nevertheless, for the sake of argument, Shaw is willing to accept that she will choose. And for him, the choice is self-evident and it is not the ending implied in My Fair Lady. Eliza will take financial responsibility for herself and Freddie. She has enough life force inside her to want dignity and her humanity above all else. She had more dignity than that as a flower girl. Shaw reveals the calculus more plainly in the sequel. I'm, you know, I'm noticing this metaphor just goes on. <laughs> yes. Eliza will marry Freddie. She will be the financial provider. Shaw in the sequel puts it this way. Will she look forward to a life of fetching Higgins slippers or to a lifetime of Freddie fetching hers. Shaw argues it's logically impossible to consider Higgins as a possible husband for Eliza. He says this, unless Freddie is biologically repulsive to her and Higgins biologically attractive to a degree that overwhelms all her other instincts, she will, if she marries either of them, marry Freddie. And that is just what Eliza did. You know, uh, no one told Higgins his Galatea was capable of walking out <laughs> on him. And her exodus isn't received well at all. I mean, Act 5 begins with Higgins racing to his mother. And he's called the police, utterly distressed. And Mrs. Higgins is outraged with her son. She calls him out for dehumanizing Eliza yet again. What right have you to go to the police and give the girl's name as if she were a thief or a lost umbrella or something? You know, that's his mother's, uh, that's his mother's response, and, and Higgins is left to explain it to her. Read what, she, what he says. Frightened her? A nonsense. She has left last night, as usual, to turn out the lights and all that, and instead of going to bed, she changed her clothes and went right off. Her bed wasn't slept in. She came in a cab for her things before seven this morning, and that fool, Mrs. Pierce, let her have them without telling me a word about it. What am I to do? Do without, I'm afraid, Henry. That girl has a perfect right to leave if she chooses. But I can't find anything. I don't know what appointments I've got. <laughs> you know, his complaints really surround function. I... Uh, what uh, Eliza could do for him. And we, the audience, are confronted with this brutal, selfish, and really unlikable and totally unsuitable version of a person. And, 
Higgins uh, is not that different than his counterpart who walks in on his conversation. You know, Alfred Doolittle, the dust man, uh, Eliza's father. You know, uh, Professor Higgins could have used the Siri, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> but back to Doolittle, he is still funny. I mean, Shaw's stage directions describe him as being resplendently dressed as for a fashionable wedding. I mean, he has a flower in his buttonhole, a dazzling silk hat, and patent leather shoes. He walks up to Higgins, and I quote here, accosts him. That's the tragedy of it, ma'am. It's easy to say chuck it, but I haven't the nerve. Which of us has? We're all intimidated. Intimidated, ma'am, that's what we are. What is there for me if I chuck it but the workhouse in my old age? I have to dye my hair already to keep my job as a dustman. If I was one of the deserving poor and had put by a bit, I could chuck it. But then why should I? A cause of the deserving poor might as well be millionaires for all the happiness they ever has. They don't know what happiness is, but I, as one of the undeserving poor, have nothing between me and the pauper's uniform but this here blasted 3000 a year that shoves me into the middle class. Excuse the expression, ma'am. You'd use it yourself if you had my provocation. They've got you at every way you turn. It's a choice between the skilly of the workhouse and the charybdis of the middle class. And I haven't the nerve for the workhouse. Intimidated, that's what I am. Broke, bought up. Happier men than me will call for my dust and touch me for their tip. And I'll look on helpless and envy them. And that's what your son has brought to me. <laughs> so He's angry. Because Higgins has made him a member of the blasted middle class. He's subject to morality, which in one way is to surrender his freedom. Um, He doesn't have the nerve to surrender his middle class money. And I mean, who does? Uh, But it comes at a price. First, uh, now the woman he was living with wants to get married. She wants to be respectable. And as a respectable middle class man, he feels obligated to give to beggars and to live by the rules of society, to put on proper clothes and, you know, do things like take a bath. And in fact, uh, he's there to hire Higgins to teach him how to talk properly. It's the middle class way. <laughs> and that's how we get to the wedding at the end of our romance. Everyone but Higgins will attend the wedding, including Mrs. Higgins and Colonel Pickering. This conversation with Doolittle in some sense feels a little bit like a digression when you watch the play. I mean, we've talked about the comparison between Doolittle and Higgins before, and we can compare them here too. But we also need to think about comparing Doolittle to Eliza. They both experience the same social change, and ironically both because of the meddling of the same man, Professor Higgins. In the play, social change is demonstrated through clothing, through language, and money. Elizabeth has language and clothing. Higgins has clothing and money. Money is a major motif, like we mentioned, throughout the whole play. You know, it has to be. Um, Hierarchy among humans is really determined by money. It's always the subtext. And the entire play begins with a conversation about money. And uh, the Ainsford Hills talk about the amount of money to be given to Eliza Their problem is that they don't have any. I mean, Higgins throws money at Eliza, which is, of course, uh, sets her to take a taxi to find out if Higgins will teach her to talk. And the discussion with the taxi being uh, that she has the money to afford one. When it goes on, you know, Act 2, there's that entire conversation basically where Doolittle wants to sell his daughter. It's a degrading conversation. And, of course, at the end of Act 4, Eliza finishes her argument with Higgins wanting to know if she can keep her clothes. You know, she doesn't want to be accused of stealing. The subtext that all of our worth is reduced to a quantitative amount of money is always underneath the surface in the story. But, I mean, isn't that the appeal of socialism or or any utopia, really? It's the ancient dream that humans are capable of a world without hierarchy, where our intrinsic human value is recognized and Uh, I'll just say, yet, that's not really possible and certainly not in this world. I mean, the play ends with Doolittle's admission into the middle class, as expressed by Colonel Pickering and Mrs. Higgins, attending a Doolittle wedding, (laughs) something that would never happen six months and 3,000 pounds ago. Good point. But speaking of things that's changed in six months, Eliza and Higgins, I mean, their conversation 
to me, sounds like a romantic breakup. In some ways, this is like a divorce. Eliza remarks that she's grown fond of Higgins and Pickerings, and Pickerings is quick, and he asks her to stay. He says, do stay with us, Eliza, but that's not the problem. She's not breaking up with Pickering. She's breaking up with Higgins, and Higgins does not ask her to stay. He does not beg women. He doesn't chase women, certainly not Eliza. This conversation that he has with her, he will only go so far into lowering himself, <laughs> and it's not that far. Well, Eliza, uh, you've had a bit of your own back, as you call it. Have you had enough, and are you going to be reasonable, or do you want any more? You want me back only to pick up your slippers and, and put up with your tempers and, and fetch and carry for you. I haven't said I wanted you back at all. Oh, indeed? Then what are we talking about? About you, not about me. If you come back, I shall treat you just as I've always treated you. I can't change my nature, and I don't intend to change my manners. My manners are exactly the same as Colonel Pickering's. You know, that's what I find remarkably crazy here. That's just not true. He spent the whole story trying to completely change another human and then says he's completely incapable of changing. Right. But she calls him out. She says, that's not true. He treats a flower girl as if she was a duchess. And I treat a duchess as if she was a flower girl. And then she says, I see. <laughs> you know, that line, um, I see, is particularly interesting. You know, what does she see? Um, Higgins thinks she sees that he's the same to everyone, and that's a good thing. The problem is that's not remotely true. I mean, he calls Colonel Pickering by a title. He refuses to call Eliza by the simple title Miss Doolittle, even after she's asked him to. And he addresses everyone else with respect. Uh, Eliza, he derides with insults and condescending demands from her the minute that they met. He bullies her uh, and yet won't even own that he does this. And he likely doesn't even see it. It's so natural for him to demean her that he doesn't notice it. Uh, it is unreflective blindness. And in this way, he is the complete opposite of her father, who clearly understands who he is in the world. And Doolittle at least knows that he's not good to Eliza. And so uh, the closest he ever comes to kindness is telling Eliza that he will miss her. And he puts it this way. I shall miss you, Eliza. I have learnt something from your idiotic notions. <laughs> I confess that humbly and gratefully, and I've grown accustomed to your voice and appearance. I mean, that is just not the most romantic language I've ever heard. It's not the most flattering thing I've ever heard. I have learned something from your idiotic notions. <laughs> I mean, I confess humbly, and that's as low as he can sink. You don't find that charming? No. no. <laughs> well, I will say to Higgins' credit, um, he at least believes she's too good to marry Freddie, and he tells her so. It's almost like he can insult her, but no one else can. And he realizes Freddie and Eliza are not intellectual equals, and she's smarter, she's more ambitious, she's more capable. Uh, the most he can do is stand outside like a goober. And Eliza knows this about Freddie, and she defends him. Freddie's not a fool, and if he's weak and poor and wants me, maybe he'd make me happier than my betters that bully me and don't want me. That is her expressing Shaw's social commentary on strong women, that feminine instinct. Women may not need money or even strength, but that doesn't mean that they don't need something. And let's quote Eliza here. I want a little kindness. I know I'm a common ignorant girl and you a book learned gentleman, but I'm not dirt under your feet. What I done, what I did was not for the dresses and the taxis. I did it because we were pleasant together and I come, came to care for you not to want you to make love to me and not forgetting the differences between us, but more friendly like. So she's wanting some respect and some companionship, you know, and again, Higgins is going to fail. I mean, his response is classic Higgins. Well, of course, that's just how I feel and how Pickering feels. Eliza, you're a fool. I mean, he may give her companionship, but he's not going to give her respect. And he ends with yet another degrading insult. Exactly. But you know what? The game's over. Eliza is done being insulted by him. Her response, that's not a proper answer to give. He goes off on yet another insulting tirade, full blame. Everything is her fault. Everything is her responsibility. 
There should be no doubt by the end of this final back and forth that this is an impasse. And Eliza does what people do when they take responsibility. She made a decision. Eliza is not making an emotional decision, as he claims, and Shaw clarifies in the sequel. He says this, Eliza, in telling Higgins she would not marry him if he asked, was not coquetting. She was announcing a well-considered decision. Well, of course I agree. I mean, Shaw has Pygmalion Higgins create a masterpiece, if you want to see it that way. Uh, but Higgins's version of Galatea is a strong woman, a human, and Eliza was never a nothing, you know, even in spite of her low station. By teaching her to speak, he empowers a woman who was always strong. And this inner development is really the Fabian uh, transformation we see over the five acts. I mean, Eliza is a servant girl no more. No, and Higgins has met his equal and found that, in fact, she is indomitable. There are quite a few morality lessons embedded in the short work. It's shockingly modern. I mean, Shaw shines a spotlight on the imbalance of strength within a relationship, specifically gendered ones, specifically romantic ones. I mean, Shaw's a lovable grouch. I'm not sure I would ever want to live with Shaw, but I would love to hang out with him on Fridays after school. It would be <laughs> quite insightful and funny. <laughs> oh, not to mention sarcastic and didactic. You know? Oh, indeed. Well, I, I agree. That would be fun. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this discussion over GBS and his famously controversial play, Pygmalion. We hope you think about how mad Shaw would be when you see Eliza come back to Higgins in the play, My Fair Lady, and we hope that makes you smile. Next episode, we will go an entirely different direction and look at an important historical speech given by AIDS activist Mary Fisher back in 1992. So we hope you come back to join us for that. And then a four-part series on Harper Lee's only book, To Kill a Mockingbird. As always, between now and then, share an episode of ours with a friend. Give us a shout-out on your social media. Give us a five-star rating on your podcast app. As with all indie podcasts, only by you sharing can we grow. Thank you for your continued support. Visit our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. If you're a teacher, we have instructional aids. If you like merchandise, we have all kinds. If you are the kind of person who financially supports causes like ours, we even have a button for that as well. Keep in touch, friends, and as always, peace out.